So good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a wonderful presentation for you today. Alana Natsin has been our virtual intern for the past 10 weeks and done an incredible job uh, with what's going on. Uh, and she is so excited to share what she's learned and the information that uh, she discovered while she's doing research with Joyce and Kelly. And we're anxious to hear more about what she has done. So Kelly, did you wanna come on board and tell us anything about your experience and give a better introduction to Alana since I always mispronounce her name. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Thank you. Excellent. So. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelly Crawford, and I am a museum specialist uh, with collections, education, and access here at Smithsonian Gardens. And each summer, my colleague Joyce Connolly and I uh, host an intern with the Archives of American Gardens um, on various archival tasks, including rehousing physical collections, cataloging, digital asset management, and also uh, research into certain aspects of American garden history. Uh, this year was a very different year uh, from other years since we were not uh, going to be able to host an intern on site due to the pandemic. Um, we've been teleworking since March and Joyce and I were not sure what a remote internship was ac actually going to look like but I'm grateful that, and happy to say that we were able to adapt all the internship projects for a completely virtual learning experience. Um, and I have to give a quick shout out to Joyce because she also made an additional effort of organizing a weekly series uh, for collections management and archival interns across the Smithsonian uh, to get together each week to talk about their projects. Um, I have to say we really lucked out with an intern who was so enthusiastic, so engaged and highly capable. I am delighted to introduce our first ever remote archives intern and recipient of the Garden Club of America's Garden History and Design Internship Scholarship, uh, Alana Mattison. Great. Alana, I should interrupt just for a second. I apologize for the interruption, but I should tell our visitors that if you have any questions, uh, there is a chat box. Please put your questions in the chat box and I'll be glad to share them with Alana at the end of her presentation. So I am I hope you have some good questions for her because that's part of her experiences to learn how to address all of this uh, in the internship. So thank you. Please now take it away and I will uh, stop showing my video and you're going to be the key speaker. Okay. <laughs> all right. I am going to share my screen. All right. And I am going to pull up my notes. To minimize the screen. Have quickly learned with Zoom that it's all about being able to uh, <laughs> to switch between screens. Okay. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. I'm gonna. Take yes, those. you're good. Perfect. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> okay. Um, well, once again, my name is Alana Natanson, um, and I am going to talk to you today about my virtual internship uh, with the Archives of American Gardens at Smithsonian Gardens, which is part of Smithsonian Institution. I've titled this presentation, How to Grow with the Virtual Smithsonian Gardens, because I'm going to explain how the Archives of American Gardens was able to offer a virtual summer internship during a global pandemic what I was able to do virtually to help the Archives of American Gardens grow, and how I grew because of my work with the Archives of American Gardens. I'm going to give you some contextual information, then I'm going to explain the three underlying purposes for the projects I worked on for the Archives of American Gardens, and I'm going to finish by drawing out some key lessons that I learned from my internship. So first, a little context about me. 
I'm originally from the Washington DC area. I attended undergrad at Salem College in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, and I'm currently studying public history in a graduate degree program at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. After I finish at NC State, I will complete a degree in library science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with the goal of eventually working in a university archives or special collections library. Um, now I'd like to give you a little bit more info about the Archives of American Gardens. It is housed under the Collections, Education and Access branch of Smithsonian Gardens and its mission emphasizes, the mission you can see here, emphasizes being a safe receptacle for images about gardening and landscape architecture, but also being a venue to share those images with others. Uh, to put some numbers behind that mission statement, there are over 150,000 photographic images in the Archives of American Gardens collections, and we have 28,653 digital images available in the Smithsonian Online Virtual Archives as of last night. Um, now, I was originally going to do an in-person internship, as Kelly mentioned, with the Archives of American Gardens, but when the archives closed due to the pandemic, my internship mentors, uh, Kelly and Joyce, were generous enough to find virtual projects that I could complete on behalf of the archives. Before I go any further, I should probably note that um, I may interchangeably use the Archives of American Gardens and its acronym AAG. Finally, I think it's important uh, to provide a little bit of context about AAG's close connection with the Garden Club of America, or, uh, G or the GCA. The GCA is an organization of 18,000 volunteers in 200 local member clubs that connect horticulture to community service through public gardening projects, through scholarships, and through political advocacy. One of GCA's historic initiatives in the early 1900s was creating and collecting photographic lantern slides. Uh, they used these slides to give lectures to garden club members about the history of American gardens and garden design. One of the, Ar I'm sorry, one of the Garden Club of America's main initiatives still is documenting gardens and sending those photographs on to the archives of American gardens. Because of donations from the GCA, the Archives of American Gardens now has 3,000 lantern uh, slides from the GCA and 37,000 GCA 35 millimeter slides. Uh, these images depict gardens from the 1920s and beyond. I'm bringing up all of this detail about the GCA uh, for two big reasons. First, I wanna point out that the GCA was doing the work of the Smithsonian Institution even before they forged a relationship with Smithsonian, with, with Smithsonian um, in that both institutions have, extort, have historically increased and diffused knowledge, especially about American gardens. Second, women have historically run the GCA and led the effort to document historic gardens through the GCA, which means that many of the historical materials that I had the opportunity to work with this summer are also evidence of women having the power to control what goes into the historical record over the course of a century. Now, before I tell you about the meat of my internship, we're going to take a quick break. One of the greatest joys of working with the collections uh, were the challenges of investigating photographs that didn't have much information on them. I wanna share one of those challenges with you. So here is a lantern slide from the Archives of American Gardens collection showing a garden in the United States. Can you guess the state in which this garden is located? If you think you know the answer, uh, you can put your, your guess in the chat box and I will give us 15 seconds to do that. You're tough, Alana. 15 seconds. <laughs> Do we play the, the Jeopardy game? The, the, the Jeopardy song? game, yeah. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you should have told me I would have downloaded the music. Oh, oh we're I'm getting sorry. some guesses. We're getting some guesses. So you awesome. tell me when you want me to um, Absolutely, read them off yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah, I can see them coming in. That's awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Well, then you say who the winner is. Okay. 
All right, I think that was 15. So the big reveal is it was a California slide. <laughs> um, so I think a bunch of you put that one in. So everybody is really on top of their identification. Um, and just a little bit more information about this image. It's actually part of our mystery garden series. There are um, several lantern slides that are from unidentified gardens. Um, we don't know where the garden is more than knowing that it's from, uh, from California. Um, we are always looking for more information about any lantern slide. So if this uh, image strikes a, uh, strikes a familiar note to you, uh, please feel free to, uh, to email the Archives of American Gardens and let them know about, um, about what your thoughts are and where more specifically this, this image might be from. All right, now we're going to move on to the meat of my internship. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the work I did for AAG, and I'm going to break it down into three categories. Uh, I made new resources available online. I made it easier for the public to search and find existing resources, and I promoted existing resources to help new people find Archives of American Garden materials. First, I will talk about the resources I was able to make available. I worked with the Smithsonian's Transcription Center, uh, which relies on the help of digital volunteers to transcribe handwritten documents in the Smithsonian's collections. I, I approved volunteer transcriptions for the diary of Gertrude Farrington. She was a longtime member of a GCA chapter in Connecticut, and she was an avid gardener. Because of my work, researchers can now conduct searches in transcriptions of Gertrude Farrington's diary. I also proposed the description and arrangement for the papers of Boris Timchenko, a DC-based landscape architect. Uh, the description of the collection is now available on the Smithsonian Online Virtual Archives, so researchers can figure out if AAG has papers about Timchenko relevant to their research projects. Timchenko was a naturalized United States citizen from Russia, so I was really excited that I got to explore uh, the history of one man's experience immigrating to the United States. And it was exciting to get to look at the designs for his most famous project, the landscape uh, design for the Watergate Hotel here in DC. Now I'm gonna go through a couple of case studies and these are going to, uh, to illustrate how I helped Smithsonian ensure researchers can easily use our materials once they're already available online. The first case study actually goes back to AAG's connection with the Garden Club of America. Some of the photographs in AAG's collection from the 20th century did not include attribution to the local garden club within the organization of the GCA that submitted the historical photographs. Over the past year, members of the Garden Club of America helped AAG identify the local garden club that submitted the historical photographs. We've now updated the online catalog records for each digital reproduction to attribute the photographs to the correct local garden club. This way, researchers will be able to discover more photographs if they know the name of the local garden club that originally submitted the photographs. My second case study involves identifying the works of Frederick Law Olmsted and his landscape architectural firm in our photographic collections. Olmsted was a famous landscape architect and writer and theorist on landscape architecture. Olmsted's architectural firm lasted over a century and worked on about 6,000 landscape architecture projects. But the problem is the name of the Olmsted firm has changed over time, as you can see in the graphic. Uh, we have over 700 photographs in our collection credited to some iteration of the Olmsted firm. However, many of those photographs listed a version of the Olmsted name inconsistent with the date that the garden was constructed. So I tagged the images with the correct version of the Olmsted firm name. Slide back up, here we go. Um, I tagged the images with the correct version of the Olmsted firm name in catalog records and added Olmsted's original five digit code for his landscape projects to the records to connect each record to historical collections at the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site 
and the Library of Congress. Adding these descriptions will make it easier for people to discover our photographs related to Olmsted projects, um, and they will pave the way so that the Archives of American Gardens and the Garden Club of America can collaborate with another organization, the National Oce Association of Olmsted Parks. Uh, they will be able to make records more discoverable for researchers uh, in preparation for the upcoming bicentennial of Olmsted's birth. In this way, I gave researchers more avenues by which to find Garden Club of America collection records and Olmsted related project records. Um, and I also found more ways and more avenues to connect between our records. In addition to creating more access points, I made it, uh, I considered how easy it is for the public to understand our Smithsonian Online Virtual Archives Catalog, also known as SOVA. I designed a two-page handout uh, walking users through searching on the SOVA catalog. And I created a brief survey that AAG can send to GCA volunteers for feedback to understand how well SOVA works for AAG researchers. Finally, a lot of my most recent work has involved promoting existing resources outside the virtual walls of the Archives of American Gardens. I have created uh, one-page reports for GCA members demonstrating practical applications of the design principles of Frederick Law Olmsted, again in preparation for the bicentennial of his birth. I also had the opportunity to collaborate with Kate Fox, who is the digital curator working on Smithsonian's American Women's History Initi Initiative, uh, American Women's History Initiative on behalf of the Archives of American Gardens and Smithsonian Gardens. Uh, we were able to, or I was able to help her draft social media posts about women who led different aspects of the horticultural world, which meant I get to do one of my favorite things, which is research women who led landscape architecture businesses and women plant pathologists. Finally, I got my feet wet with the Smithsonian's Learning Lab project where users can create digital collections of Smithsonian artifacts. I used botanical specimens, political buttons, and stamps to fill out a digital collection that all tied back into the Gertrude Farrington diaries that volunteers had transcribed. In this way, I was able to use the transcriptions for research, just as the transcription center had intended. Uh, this way we can also attract people looking at botanical collections or looking at political button collections and show them how those, or how those artifacts connect to experiences of a real live person. So just to conclude this section, I'm going to put some numbers uh, behind what I have produced for the Archives of American Garden. Some of the numbers uh, that you can see here that I'm most proud of are correcting over 200 records related to Olmsted Garden projects and drafting seven social media posts, six of which are about women in horticulture. Okay, I know that was a lot of talking at you, so I'm going to pose another challenge. Uh, can you guess the common name for the purple plant in this lantern slide? If you think you know the answer, uh, put it in the chat box and I will start my timer and go for 15 seconds again. <laughs> Anna, this is a great one because we all know that uh, sometimes the uh, artists that colored the pictures on the plants uh, didn't always pick the correct uh, uh, color to, Thank to you. Yeah, on, it, absolutely. Yeah, on the slide. So I'm curious to see uh, what this one really is, because I have a guess, but I'm not sure if I'm right or not. So oh, okay. looks like we're getting some uh, good guesses. Okay. So since you can see them, yeah. when the time is up, please let us know the true <laughs> answer. The excitement builds. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, Cindy, you should definitely be a, uh, be a host for a game show. I think you, uh, you got us through that. Um, so I will go ahead and reveal the answer. It was Wisteria, so a lot of you got it. Uh, we're right on top of it with it. Um, I know there are a lot of experts in this crowd, so maybe this will be an easy win to start off the day. Uh, and to Cindy's point, um, with the, uh, when the slide manufacturer is coloring in um, the photograph, I guess I should say that I took my interpretation, Wisteria, based on um, the original description for the, uh, for the lantern slide, which was Wisteria Tree in Bloom. And that was at Dalkeith, um, which is in New Jersey. Okay. 
Okay. So we have reached the segment where I'm going to discuss what I learned from my internship. Uh, first, I'm going to put on my historian's hat because one thing this uh, internship underscored to me is just how much historical resources in the archives reflect the eras in which historical figures created those historical resources, or they reflect the era in which the archivist incorporated the resources into the archives. During my cataloging with the Archives of American Gardens, there were some cases where the name of properties or the owners of properties had changed since the time that the image was created. For instance, the original photographer of this photograph entitled the garden in Littleton, New Hampshire, the Beck Garden in 1933. But by 1936, the land turned into the St. Mary's in the Mountain School. And then later that became the White Mountain School. So researchers who know the landscape as either of those schools might not know to search for Beck Garden and end up seeing images of the land. Because these images are digitally reproduced online, we can add all of those name iterations and all of those name changes onto the record. And we can continue to add new names as new information becomes available. In this way, a lot of the records uh, for the Archives of American Gardens are in fact living records and living images. Now I'm going to talk to you about what I learned about the Smithsonian Institution from getting a behind the scenes look. I think I really took to heart the first principle in the Smithsonian strategic plan, which is to be one Smithsonian. That initiative includes, quote, initiating new lines of communication across the Smithsonian, end quote. So in the era of COVID-19, I learned that Smithsonian is managing to be one Smithsonian through its online initiatives as well. Um, for, you know, for example, it's that American Women's History Initiative, which draws out stories of women from across Smithsonian museums. Uh, also through the Learning Lab, where users, especially students and educators, get to connect artifacts for themselves from across the Smithsonian Institution and its collections. I think I also discovered that Smithsonian Gardens has been oriented towards one Smithsonian for as long as it has been an institution within the Smithsonian Institution. Smithsonian Gardens cares for the formal gardens and the landscaping around all of the other Smithsonian museums, which means that the Smithsonian Gardens has always had to consider the ways that every other uh, Smithsonian museums are working and understand what they're doing. The Smithsonian Garden has had to align its goals with the goals of other museums. Finally, I learned that volunteers are critical to increasing knowledge at the Smithsonian. Those are digital volunteers through the Transcription Center uh, and volunteers like the Garden Club of America volunteers who provide us and increase the, uh, the collections in the Archives of American Gardens. Now I want to explain what I learned about uh, the archival profession, the profession I eventually hope to join. Um, first, I learned to set a limit on how much I would fix records in our online catalog. This is what I call not always taking the deep dive. Uh, when you start to fix one problem with online records, you inevitably find others. I learned to note down possible issues in the catalog that I noticed along the way, but to prioritize and focus my attention on the task that I originally set out to do. Second, I learned not to necessarily try to explain to the public what my mentor calls how the sausage gets made. When first reaching out to the public, I learned to make the story of collections uh, as simple as possible and to pare down procedures uh, to the fewest steps as possible. Finally, I'd like to talk about what I learned about doing a virtual internship. I appreciated having a set of finite projects that each ended in a product. I also really valued the, care, the chance to attend virtual meetings. Uh, these were meetings for the Collections Education and Access Branch of Smithsonian Gardens, uh, general Smithsonian garden meetings, um, and then a meeting uh, that my mentor Joyce organized for museum collection interns and archives interns from across the Smithsonian Institution. All of these gave me a better sense of the everyday logistics uh, in a unit 
in a department, sort of in a museum and in a whole large institution um, that I had only ever gotten to see as a visitor. I think I really took home, uh, finally, the comment that for a virtual internship, there is no such thing as over communication. I had weekly video check-ins that were valuable for checking on my progress on projects, and I had daily email check-ins with my mentors that helped me track my day-to-day -day tasks. And whenever my mentors were teaching me a new skill, they did provide me with, you know, with written instructions, but we also always did a Zoom meeting in addition. Um, that was a way for them to be able to stop me before I made collect or before I made mistakes across all of the collection records I worked on. Uh, the collection records I worked on. I learned that virtual internships are an opportunity to take on new online initiatives, but that those initiatives will falter if they are not based on clear communication of expectations. So to conclude, I am going to revisit my title, How to Grow with the Virtual Smithsonian Gardens. I helped the Smithsonian to share more materials with the public and made that sharing process easier. In turn, Smithsonian taught me about the power of online collaboration between Smithsonian museums, with other organizations, and with student interns. I may never have stepped foot in the Capitol Gallery, which is the home of the Archives of American Gardens, but I have felt like the part of, or I have felt like a part of the Smithsonian's institutions and the Garden Club of America's mission to educate the public. And at this time, I would like to thank Kelly Crawford and Joyce Conley, museum specialists at the uh, Archives of American Gardens, for their fortitude in taking on a virtual intern for the first time in AAG's history, as well as their generosity in sharing all of their knowledge and their patience in teaching me about the Smithsonian's many systems. I'd also like to thank Paula Healy, my academic appointment coordinator, for navigating Smithsonian guidelines uh, for an online internship in a very uh, changing situation. And I'd also like to thank Cindy Brown, uh, supervisory horticulturist, collection specialist, and manager of the CEA branch uh, for ensuring that I was still able to complete this internship remotely, uh, really spearheading that effort. Um, I would also like to thank the Collections Education and Access branch as a whole for welcoming, welcoming me into their midst and teaching me about how to educate with gardens. And I would like to thank the Garden History and Design Committee of the Garden Club of America for generously sponsoring this internship. And I would like to thank all of you for listening to this final presentation. At this point, I am happy to take questions.